Good morning. My name is Marty Zygman, and uh, I'll be talking about Bitcoin in a modern financial system. Basically, I'm an expert in business software. I previously was a CPA. I've been doing this kind of work for the last 25 years. Uh, I run a systems integration practice out of Southern California. What I'm going to do today is talk about how Bitcoin and a particular implementation of Bitcoin in a modern financial system. What is a modern financial system? Well, it would be cloud-based. We're talking about accounting, things like inventory management, orders, invoicing your customers, receiving cash to pay bills and so forth, right? And so I'm going to illustrate that. There's two key concepts that I'd like you to be able to take away from this talk. The first concept is about foreign currency accounting. For the purposes of this conversation, pragmatically, Bitcoin is a foreign currency. As treating it as a foreign currency, there's two key things that will emerge. One is you'll be able to make good assessments around your economic performance of working with it, trading with it. And two, you'll be able to meet your regulatory requirements because there's standards already in the marketplace for how to do foreign currency accounting. The second thing that I hope to show you today is that an integration that's deep into a financial system will actually drop the cost of working with Bitcoin in such a way that we'll see major adoption happen, happening by larger organizations, which is what we really need in order for it to spread for, for adoption. So I think I'll, the best thing for me to do is do this through a demonstration. The demonstration, in order to work in a financial system, there's a number of things that need to come together, and I'm going to illustrate each one of these things. So let me just step through it. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about exchange rates, right? If it's going to be treated as foreign currency, we're going to talk about this, but I'm going to talk about it in the context of micro bitcoins and price updates. Let me uh, switch, switch screens here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this financial system because I'm going to talk about the points in the financial system. It's really not relevant which financial system we're in. It's just this is a particular proof of concept so you can see. So the first thing I want you to see is that if we're going to be tracking prices, we're going to need in the financial system prices of Bitcoin. So here what we have is an exchange rate table and prior to uh, prior to uh, uh, getting ready for this, I basically updated it with the latest prices as of 8 o'clock this morning. And at that point in time, the last price say, was $122, $122 for USD. Basically, uh, an organization in a uh, Bitcoin world would likely update this table frequently, and that would run in the background, maybe every 15 minutes. But that's up to the organization to determine, right? Next thing I want to show is that in a modern financial system, this one actually supports 190 different currencies, we need, to, uh, we need a placeholder in the financial system for Bitcoin. What we've done here is we've taken or substituted a particular, uh, let, me see, let me see if I can demonstrate this here. We've substituted a currency because since, since Bitcoin does not today have an ISO certification, the financial systems aren't necessarily ready to accept it. So what, we're, what we need to do is we need to substitute a currency for Bitcoin. In this case, I took the Thai bot as, a, as, as, a, as one of the currencies to substitute. I like the Thai bot because its symbol uses the B, Right? And, 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 we'll, and I'm not going to be trading in Thaibot normally in this organization, so I can work with that. What's important, though, is that financial systems are not used to the decimal points that we see in our Bitcoin. And so what we need to do is we need to, in this case, I converted to micro Bitcoin, which is essentially six decimal places in. So then that way, if the total space is actually eight decimal points, I can then use the two decimal points that I'll get to represent the total. So in essence, that $122 I need to express 
in an exchange rate in micro bitcoins. Once I do that, then I have the opportunity. Let me, let me just see here what my next topic was. Let, let me demonstrate then what this would look like, because once you have multiple currencies inside your financial system, you have an opportunity to express your goods and services in different prices. What we're going to see here, this is an e-commerce site that's built on top of this financial system. It's all fully integrated real time. Because it's fully integrated and so forth, it allows for transacting business. A modern financial system allows you to do that, it allows you to transact with your customers and do the proper kind of accounting in the back office. If you notice here, we actually have a product that is, I think the best way to show this is, notice down here I have a currency selector. Imagine you're a customer on a website and you normally work in dollars. Let's just start in dollars, should have started that way. I tried to price it very close to, to the exchange rate just so we can see what's happening easier. So this air purifier is $122.76 US dollars. But let's suppose you're not in the United States or you have Bitcoin and you wanna, you wanna uh, use Bitcoin. You could effectively use micro Bitcoins here and it would be priced at this is effectively one Bitcoin, right? Now, I'm not suggesting that this is how you would format that, right? That would be up to the merchant and so forth. But these are some of the concerns that are coming forth, right? If, if the purchasing power of a Bitcoin continues to grow, the decimal points are tripping us up. But this is a choice of the merchant. It's not really relevant for this discussion. The idea, though, is as you can imagine that if I were to place an order here, it's going to end up in the back-end system for fulfillment. So let's go to the fulfillment system and place an order. So let's imagine now we're not doing e-commerce over the tele or you know through website. We have a customer calling on the telephone wanting to buy that air purifier. What we would do is we would start a transaction. So I'm going to initiate a transaction as if I'm doing phone sales. I'm going to go ahead and select a customer I've been working with. We want to purchase that same air purifier, which was the A350. Notice here that the same price, $122.76, right, because it's fully integrated. But the customer over the phone says, you know what, I'd like to pay in Bitcoin. What, what would that cost? There you go, the price of it dynamically changes. So the power to the organization that treats Bitcoin as foreign currency in their financial system has the mechanism to automatically and dynamically know the prices of things. Let's go ahead and purchase that. What we've done is we've enhanced the financial system to include Bitcoin because natively it does not have these things. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, hey, when I save this order, I want to initiate a payment request, and I want to make sure it goes out to me. Give that a sec to process. So this would be I'm committing the order. I'm being patient. <laughs> Did it complete? I can't tell here. It looks like it's still spinning here. Let's give that a sec. Typically, it's faster than this. There we go. OK, so as you can see, I've got my micro bitcoins here. I've got the order committed. I now have an order ID. 
if I go over to my Bitcoin tab, I now have a record here that's a payment request. You can see that it's been requested. I know the exchange rate. In this implementation, we actually went out and got the latest prices. And at that point in time, it was 122.80 in this implementation. That would be a choice for the, for the organization. They can use their internal rate tables or they might go get spot rates, say. Let's go now look from the customer's perspective. We now have a payment request that's arrived. I see this has just arrived. So now I'm the customer, right? And now I need to pay for the goods and services. So here we have an email, which is a request for payment. We can see that this was the invoice. We're asking for this many micro bitcoins, right? And here is the address. So let's go do that. I got my wallet. I'm in a test mode here. I like to always grab this label over here, which is descriptive. Oops. And I see right here it's saying send one Bitcoin, which we set that up there. Why don't we hit send? Great. Now, we, the next part of this I kind of call the Bitcoin transaction coordination because we don't want to ship the good until we know the monies have been received, right? So what we would be doing here, what the organization would do, is we, if we go to our Bitcoin payment request, let's have a look at that. This was what was initiated. We can see what we're doing is a capture. So a, the, a, modern, a modern financial system, we could both capture, receive Bitcoin, but there's no reason why we can't pay. Once you have Bitcoin, why not pay your bills? This implementation actually can pay bills with Bitcoin. Here was the invoice. This was the amount we're asking for. Here's the QR code. Now, at this point in time, the blockchain, we don't know the transaction, but let's go ahead and get status. Make sure I press that okay. Oops, let me try that one more time. There we go. The status now has changed to unconfirmed. We now have a transaction ID. Bitcoin, or micro Bitcoin in this case, are on their way. The organization can set up rules upon what are the different statuses they want to have in terms of how many blockchains that they want to have confirmations and so forth. But the idea is, is once the Bitcoin has been received, then it's safe to ship the good. So let's, we don't have the time to wait for that Bitcoin to arrive. So go, let's go look at another transaction that has already been received. You know what, I did one last night, which is right here, let's see, unconfirmed. Let's go into that because I know the Bitcoin has, sh should have finally arrived since last night. So let's just get the request. Right now it's unconfirmed, so this is a different transaction I did last night. Let's, now normally this would run in the background for an organization, and they would use the status to indicate whether the Bitcoins have arrived, and they would run their operations in their warehouse to be able to know safe to ship, right? Indeed, look, it has been sent. Now, some other things that are important here that have, have happened. Now we have some accounting to do. Money has arrived. So if you look over here, our initiating transaction was an invoice, which was the request for payment. But now that the money has arrived, we have a concluding transaction. This is effectively the accounting for the, for the Bitcoin that, have, that has arrived. And so we're essentially saying the money's been deposited because we're treating the Bitcoin like a bank account. Let me show you what the, for all the accountants out there, let me show you what the debits and credits look like because that's for me where it always really hits home. If you look at the GL impact of this, this is the first opportunity for you to observe something interesting. Notice that the, that the presentation in the general ledger 
is in USD, but we transacted in Bitcoin. The modern financial system basically presents information in your base currency while at the same time it's holding the fact that you did things in a different currency. We didn't convert the dollars, right? There was nothing here that did conversion. We are holding Bitcoin. But at, for this transaction, at that point in time, at the price we did it, it was worth purchasing power of $123.25. That's what has you, as a business owner, be able to make the proper assessment around your economic performance of your trade. Okay, so I showed the order, the order management. I showed you some accounting. Now what we can do is run a financial statement. So we'll do a balance sheet, which is basically where we're holding our Bitcoin in terms of its balance. What I want you to focus on is this one right here. Effectively, this was the wallet that I directed the funds to. A merchant may have multiple wallets for different purposes, right? Each one of them having a particular general ledger account. Here it's saying it's $895.64 or 7.8 Bitcoin, which would, should match up to what their wallet balance is. Now, most of you might say, wait a minute now, is that the price of, you know, the current price of a Bitcoin times, time, time, the current price of Bitcoin times the number of Bitcoins that we have, or micro Bitcoins really here, is 895.64? No. What this is, is a culmination of all the transactions that you did at different prices. And now what we have is, okay, we have the opportunity for something called currency gains or losses through revaluation, which is a normal concept because prices do change, right? And you need to be able to recognize that. So a modern financial system allows for that. So what we do is we run a function called revalue open currency valuations. Effectively, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab all the bank accounts. So notice here I have different bank accounts and different currencies. I'm focusing on this one because I know this is where that came through. And I'm going to say save. Now, tr this is often done in whenever you're uh, reporting your financial results, typically monthly, quarterly, definitely annually, you perform this function. You've got to remember that this is what global organizations do all the time. None of this is strange. This is all what larger organizations think about. This is all very comforting to them as, the, as the traditional kind of accounting. Right, again, it looks like it's complete. Let's go look at what it produced. So it created a transaction for us called currency revaluation. If we pop down, if we look here, the price of the Bitcoin at the current exchange rate resulted in a gain of $67.88. If the prices fall, we're going to have losses. If the prices go up, we're going to have gains. You get to determine the frequency for which you're going to recognize that and look at that. Now that we have actually have an, a gain or loss transaction, we can go over to our income statement to see what the presentation of that would look like. So what a couple things I want to just show here. One, on the income statement, we could see we had sales of $721.16, but they were actually done in a different currency. They were done in micro bitcoins. So here's your revenue side. Down at the bottom, which is traditionally where the presentation is for gains and losses at the bottom, here represents the, un the cumulative gains and losses from all the different currencies that you're working with in your business reported on the income statement. These gains and losses then are reported just like everything else you do in your business, and this helps you meet your regulatory requirements. So I think what's most important here to just see is, is that global organizations that are working with multiple currencies and so forth 
are used to this. This is all standard practices. There's nothing weird going on. By treating Bitcoin as a foreign currency, you're going to have the listening of major organizations and so forth. They'll know how to treat it. They'll know how to then report on it. These practices will help with adoption worldwide. And that's, this, is, this is my vision on ways we need to go to make things very easy and to increase our adoption. And at this point, I think I'll just open it up for questions. If we could use the mic, that would be great. Thank you. Hi. I just have a bunch of really quick questions. Hopefully I'm not repeating anything you've uh, mentioned already. Um, is this a f I'm going to just spit them out really quickly. Is this a finished product? What is your pricing model for this? Um, are there example customers? And how does your software, how frequently does your software update the, v the US dollar value or whatever currency value of a Bitcoin? This, sof this software is alpha so that we do not have any live customers. We have beta customers that are lined up. Pricing model is to be determined. There, there is a pricing model. Can you give us a hint? Range? Well, something that will be very compelling from the listening of the merchants, probably somewhere around a percent or less. Uh, one of the things I probably didn't show here is, is that the transaction fees that we will be charging will also get debited and credited into their bank accounts so that it's all hands off. Frequency for which the currency will update. In this implementation, we're going to suggest every 15 minutes just, to, just because it produces processing. It takes away some, from the processing power of their own things. But that's really up to, up to the organization. These are parameters that can be set by them. One really quick large, uh, last question. Uh, what is your ETA to a finished product? Thank you. Uh, well, I would probably say uh, we'll probably be making a formal announcement, you know, summer. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, please. If you could you use the mic. Cool. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, is it set up to use uh, like Litecoin, Feather coins, other currencies, or is it just Bitcoins right now? T today's implementation right now is only in um, Bitcoin. There's no reason why, you know, the, the way we architected this, that we could change out different kinds of engines and so forth. Uh, naturally, we're trying to go where we think the market is, so, my, you know, Bitcoin makes sense here. Yes. Thanks. Um, one thing that you didn't cover there was, in your demonstration, was uh, and, and I'm more interested in kind of the more abstract accounting uh, sure. as opposed to their specific implementation, but um, how would you represent uh, exchange accounts when the company or, you know, or the business entity is essentially selling you know, or ex converting its own currency? Um, how, how would you represent that? Well, I was thinking about that today, actually. The, uh, you know, I'd, I'd probably want to prototype it a little bit, but I would probably have two bank accounts meaning, you know, again, we're treating these as bank accounts. I would set up two bank accounts, one for the Bitcoin, one for the target uh, repository of the, of the currency you're trying to get to, I'm assuming USD. And then I would probably do an accounting where I would have four journal entries. I would have, uh, you know, if I'm selling the Bitcoin, I would credit Bitcoin cash, right? And I would probably debit some kind of holding account on the income statement. And then the corresponding price of that, I would debit uh, USD cash on the other account, and I would credit the same account, the net result of it would represent the gain or loss and hit the income statement appropriately. Excellent. And uh, if I could just make a suggestion, if, uh, if you could uh, design your software in such a way that it could take uh, uh, the history outputs from the exchange, like uh, for example, Mt. Gox reports it in like CSV format, so it could import a CSV format and can create those, uh, I think you have a winner right there. Uh, sure. Well, I mean, we are using today Mt. Gox API to get pricing, right, and so forth. There's no reason why we couldn't just backfill that table. And then once you have that table, you have no problem producing graphs and all the other good things that you get to have. Those are all just sort of freebies that you get in a nice financial system. Right. Uh, just to clarify, I meant uh, the actual, like, transactions in terms of uh, the exchanges. 
Oh. You, you say you would, you, you know, essentially create four journal entries if you could have a, you know, if your software sure, yeah. took, uh, you know, the data from the sure, exchange I mean, and, and created those. I, I'm, I'm anticipating that our customers are likely going to want to have things like that, and then these would be great enhancements because our vision for this, and I think it should be for everyone, would be that you want as trouble-free implementation as possible. The vision around this is let's get the bookkeepers out of worrying about it. I'm, what I'm listening to when people are trying to transact with Bitcoin, they're very confused. The, most organizations are smaller when they're doing this, so they don't really have any background. Certainly U, U.S. customers don't have really uh, much experience with foreign currencies, so they're, they're lost, right? And do I treat it as a commodity? Do I put it on inventory? What do I what, what do? I do right? So uh, the idea here is the fact that Bitcoin in, is really just another ledger all we're doing is synchronizing the ledgers between a financial system and the blockchain. Let's get that done really seamless so that you have the audit trail and so forth and really hands-free between all the bookkeeping required. Excellent. Yeah. Do we have other questions? Yes. Yeah, again. Sure, take your time. <laughs> so uh, I came in a little bit late. Maybe you said this in the intro, but are you targeting SMB? Are you targeting the big boys? Are you going to be integrating with other systems like you know PeopleSoft SAP or staying sort of down market a little bit? I mean, what's sort of the, the, the path and the expectation there? So we, we architected it so that other ERP packages could, could uh, follow this sort of implementation. I already have uh, Great Plains and AX partners that are signing up uh, to go forward with it. Really, it's more around the opportunity of somebody who's going to speculate because all of this, if we don't go anywhere, right, and if the regulatory environment gets cold or hot, however you think about it, right, it shuts down the space. So, you know, it's a speculative endeavor. And it's just a simple, I mean, I'm not super techie, but it's just a, an, a, an API, like a REST-based API that for Precisely. getting in with an OAuth authentication, or what's the authentication on it? It's, it's got an enterprise level backbone, right, which, is, which works on the Bitcoin network, and then basically we're using REST calls, and some of the things we're thinking about doing is locking it down to particular data centers and so forth. And part of the architecture of this is that we're not pushing at all into the accounting systems. The accounting systems pull. Right, it's well, much yeah, more right. scalable. Right. right. Makes sense. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Very good. Are there other questions? Okay. Thank you.